I was born in uh, uh, upstate New York, in Carthage, New York, which is right near Lake Ontario. It's very close to Canada. It's very, it was a village I was born in. And my father uh, got a job in the 50s, and we moved down south to Bowling Green, Kentucky. So we were Yankees, and we were transplanted to the south in this small town in the Bible Belt. And I spent my entire youth and, and uh, my teenage years going to one school in Bowling Green. And uh, that's kind of where I learned everything I needed to know about uh, life, about evil, about people. And I had fell in love with the movies there. Um, my mother was a big movie fan. So I would go to the movies a lot with her, and they, we had two downtown theaters and two drive-ins, and uh, I just, I suppose, it was because my family was so out of place in the South. Well, this is a Jim Crow South, and uh, my father was a, uh, a PhD in music and had come from uh, Eastern sensibilities. We, we came from we're Plymouth Rock background type folks. And to then to go down to the Jim Crow South where there's just a, a religion and racism was just a shock. It was a shock to my parents, it was a shock to me. I felt really out of place there. So I think the movies were an escape. It was an escape from the place that I lived and I think probably it was also an escape from various problems in, in my household. My father was a PhD in music and he uh, specialized in composition and the violin. So I grew up with music all constantly playing. Either my dad was playing or on the stereo he was playing classical music. I think the first movie I ever saw, I believe, was The African Queen. And uh, I was a little confused about what I was seeing because I was very young then. That was 51 or 2. And I was born in 1948, so I would have been very young. I wasn't sure what was real or not real or whether the actors were behind, behind the curtain or whether they were is really happening in front of me. The movie that influenced me the most, I think, was a film called It Came From Outer Space was a 3D film in 1952. Again, I was very young. And I, f I sort of fell in love with fantasy and science fiction in that film. My father had an 8mm movie camera, and he finally gave it to me because he hated uh, making movies because I think what he was interested in was still shots of people and, and family get-togethers and whatever. And so he gave me the movie camera. He didn't care for it anymore. So I inherited a movie camera and a projector and a screen and a splicer, a real primitive glue splicer. I could splice pieces of film together. So I started making little fragments of films, uh, including my classmates as stars and a little crude special effects. And they were basically unwatchable. And I, I don't think they exist anymore. I hope not. I remember I was on a USO tour, uh, a musical group. We went toured the bases in Germany in 1968, and we were playing for all the soldiers that were stationed there. And in part of our job as the as the band was to go and talk to the soldiers. And I went to this one uh, kind of rec room they had, and they were nice guys. They just wanted to talk to people back home. I picked up this magazine that was sitting there, and it talked about film schools going to schools of cinema at USC and UCLA and, and and I thought wow you could study this that's interesting sort of got me thinking so I, I looked up uh, I did research on all the film schools applied to several of them and USC accepted me I don't know why actually because I wrote this terrible uh, you had to write a paper to get in. I wrote this. It was awful what I wrote, but they accepted me, so off I went. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had uh, I had majored in English, and uh, I broken up with my girlfriend at the time. I was heartbroken. I didn't care about English. I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to get out of the South, and I wanted to come to Los Angeles, you know. And uh, USC had a reputation for being close to Hollywood. It was, it was connected with the film industry. 
in classic uh, filmmaking, classic directors, and, and that's what I wanted to learn. Well, when I was in film school, I started making a, pro a senior project, uh, and it evolved into a feature. It was a science fiction movie I made with a, a classmate of mine, Dan O'Bannon, who went on to be a very talented guy, writer, a director in his own right. We made this little 16 millimeter movie, and it was eventually, we, f we got it to feature length eventually, and it was blown up and uh, released in theaters. So that was my first movie. And uh, Dark Star was released. 1975, I think. We worked on it for about four years. And uh, I can't watch it anymore. It's an amateur film, but, but it, I'm very grateful. When it was released, I was hopeful that it would be my showcase as a director and I would get hired. Dark, Dark Star comes out and nothing happens. Don't get hired, no one wants me to direct. But I do get an agent out of the, the job, the deal, and the agent uh, says, you have to write your way into the movie business. So I began writing scripts. Unfortunately, I hate writing scripts, hate, hate it. But I wrote some stuff, Got one was bought by Columbia, became the eyes of Laura Mars. Um, a couple of them, I, I, it was a good living at the time because you could write a screenplay and make a whole lot of money once you join the Writers Guild, and even if the movie didn't get made, you could, you know, live. And it was only uh, my second film came about, Assault on Precinct 13, because an in private investor wanted to make a film. And I was in the right place at the right time, and we shot that in 1976. That was released. Nobody cared. I was determined to, you know, to make it in the movies. I wanted to make a living at being a director, that was my goal. So the third time I did it, well I did it, a couple of TV movies. So I had learned the ropes by then. And I, I made uh, 1978, again another small investor, had a, had a distribution company so I made Halloween and that one was the one that worked. Hey dude, how you doing? Okay, how are you? Halloween was a, a slow success when it came out. It was not immediately successful because it was a small distribution company. They, um, they would show it, they would move prints around the country. So they'd open in Los Angeles with a few prints, move those prints to the next city and open there. So it was not an immediate success. It began to build. So I was on other projects and I thought once again, well, let me back up, the reviews for Halloween were not all that positive. And so I thought, well, it's the same old story, you know. But at that point, I just, I wanted to direct, and that was my life. And I just kept working at it. The distributor of uh, Assault on Precinct 13 came to me, Erwin Yablons, and he had a deal with a man who was financing films, and he said, I want to make a horror film about this serial killer who's stalking and killing babysitters. And uh, that was it. So what can you do with that, he said to me. And I made a deal to do it, to have uh, creative control over it. And, and so uh, I wrote it, and I wrote it as a, as a, it was a reaction against a lot of the horror films that I had seen. The modern horror film began in 1960 with, with Psycho. So it changed from this romantic uh, fatalism and romanticism, gothic horror, cobwebs, and, and Frankenstein, Dracula type thing into the modern age. So how are you gonna do something with a concept as feeble as um, babysitters being stalked by a killer? So I tried to kick it into another level, meaning that the, the killer himself would not be really human. In, a, in some ways, although he was. So I thought of the hook. This is an old urban legend where, where the teenagers are parking and then there's a hook in the, anyway, hook in the car. And just sort of took that to, a, 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 a extended that a little bit in terms of the story, but it was just an exercise in style, which was fun for me to do. 
Well, after uh, Halloween, I made The Fog. I had written that, and I was not really happy with the movie, but uh, it doesn't matter. Along came an opportunity to direct uh, a remake of The Thing at Universal. It would be my first studio oh, feature. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. We won't have that white situation Six over there. Morning. Right. So I, I think, think we'll be okay. We, well, I had mixed feelings about The Thing because of my love of Howard Hawks' film, but I did it. We went in a, a different direction in terms of what, what it was. It was a very um, overt creature as opposed to a creature who was in shadows. Every movie I've directed, whether it's a script by me or by someone else, there's always a point where the writer, whether it's me or someone else, has written something that cannot be done, that is ineffective, that is stupid. It reads well, but once you come to execute it, you say, who wrote this? Crap. So there's always something in a script that, uh, for me personally, my taste is ridiculous. And I found it to be true in my own films. I'll or look at the, the work for the morning that I've written something and was gonna shoot it, and I go, why did I write that? That's a ridiculous idea. Because you're not on the floor on the set. You're not dealing with people. You're not dealing with real space. So a lot of, of what I've experienced is pretty much the same, whether I've written or not. Shooting a, any movie on location, is, it has its challenges. For instance, there's a, there's a sequence in Starman where our, uh, our leads are, are going through Monument Valley. Monument Valley is in Utah, Arizona, Utah. John Ford country, so you imagine these beautiful vistas. The day we shot it was, was this cold, overcast day. So you had to adapt to what the weather was. So it wasn't beautiful vistas necessarily. They were in the background, but they were against leaden gray skies. It's hard to work in, on locations. However, the results are often just fabulous because you're working with the best light possible is, is natural light, available light. Some of the effects in terms of special visual effects, like the thing, take for instance, uh, I'm glad that we didn't have the, the modern technology when we did that. That was all done in, a, in live in a room, in space, with inertia, with real stuff moving. Because a lot of movies nowadays, uh, they don't, they look f fake, like cartoons. They're just, they're cartoon stuff. I tend not to respond to that as much. But a lot of audiences love it, so I don't know. What are you gonna know? Every movie has difficulties in the shooting. So you can mention anything and there'll be problems. They always come up. Escape from New York was a, a, the second movie in a two movie commitment to this company called Abco Embassy. They made a two picture deal with me. The first one was The Fog. The second one was supposed to be uh, based on a book called The Philadelphia Experiment, which was about a, this urban legend about an experiment that took place in World War II the invisible battleship <laughs> type thing, and I was fascinated by it. I started writing the script until I realized there was no third act. There's no ending to it because it was a, it's like flying saucers. The minute you try to explain them and you go, you go to it's boring, there's no ending. It's always better if they're a mystery. So I went to the head of the company and I said, uh, I don't wanna do this, no, I don't know how to do it. But I have this other script that I wrote in the 70s called Escape from New York. So I handed it to him, and that's what we did. It was a combination of Death Wish, which was the view of New York as being this pit of horror, and uh, Clint Eastwood movies, who I admire gr a great deal, and uh, this novel called Planet of the Damned or Pl Planet of No Return. I can't remember the exact title. It was by Harry Harrison. It was about... This planet in, in outer space was the most dangerous place in the world. So who do you send? The most dangerous man. It's a very basic plot. So we didn't have that much money to make Escape from New York. We only had about four to five million dollars at the time. And it was a fantasy, future fantasy. But uh, 
We got very lucky shooting it. I had a terrific uh, production designer, Joe Alves. Dedean Cundy was the cameraman. And uh, we shot it in St. Louis. It stood in for New York. It, St. Louis had had this big fire and had burned out big parts of the city, so they were, they were destroyed. And it was a futuristic, dystopian type of thing. There were a couple of them that had been done in movies. And this, I think it was supposed to take place in 1997. Things didn't turn out that way, did they? Both uh, Kurt Russell and Donald Pleasance and Sam Neill I worked with twice. Uh, I understand what their, what their needs are and what they're doing and their approach to a part. And they understand mine. So there's a lot of, uh, kind of, the courtship doesn't have to quite be so long before we get to the real thing. We can dive right into it. And all those, those are my kind of actors. They're all about the work. They're not really about themselves. They're not really about uh, what's going on right now in, around us. The cameras, the, this and this. They're about what, what the story is. And I love how they come across on screen. That, that's really the big thing. I met Kurt Russell on Elvis when we did this three-hour TV movie. He was really good at it as an actor. He had had a lot of experience. He's my kind of actor, and he shows up. He knows his lines. He, he, he's ready to work. He never gives you a problem. He understands the part, understands how to play a scene, understands how to play for the camera. You'd be surprised how many actors don't know how to do that nowadays and he was Disney trained meaning that uh, he, was, he was trained I mean in those days if you didn't say the line exactly the script supervisor would cut the camera it wasn't even the director Kurt Russell and I just became friends I respected his professionalism and his ability and somehow he kept coming up for parts in movies that I was making Elvis, Escape from New York, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, and Escape from L.A. Uh, partially, part of it was due to the fact that uh, my uh, first assistant director and later producer was his brother-in-law. So every movie that I worked on, the brother-in-law, unbeknownst to me, would give Kurt the script. So he would already have read it and want to do it or not want to do it. So. Uh, I kept wondering, why is he always around? And I really enjoyed working with him. I'm hesitant to talk too much about some of the things that happened on the set of movies because a lot of people that made the, the films are still alive and uh, a lot of the hijinks w were involving things that we none of us should be doing. None of us. And uh, probably the most dangerous location that I worked in was in Stewart, British Columbia. When we shot the thing, we were up on a glacier. At the bottom of the glacier was this small town of Stewart, and it was uh, in, in Alaska, essentially, right next to a place called Hyder, Alaska. Hyder, Alaska used to have a uh, police department. The residents burned it down and ran the police out of town. So there's no law in Stewart. So here we were, these Hollywood people descending on this little town, and there was nothing to do there. So what did everybody do? They drank. And uh, there were some adventures in, in that town that I, I'm was sworn to secrecy, I can't tell you, but they were pretty, pretty incredible stuff. Starman was a lucky... Uh, incident in my life in terms of, of a project. It came along because I was working at Columbia. I had done Christine for them. And Starman was a script that had been around a while. It was a romantic comedy between uh, alien and human. And uh, E.T. had kind of taken the, the thunder out of the movie. But they still wanted to make it. And for me, it was a real opportunity. It was a road movie. So it took place in, across the country. and It was, it was great. And if one could find the right lead. So uh, Jeff Bridges finally came along, and he just Jeff is one of our great actors. He's just one of our greatest actors. 
And he was brilliant in it, you know. Karen Allen was terrific, and Charlie Martin Smith was in it. We had a great time making it. It was, I, I enjoyed it because I didn't have to um, work with the tropes of horror. I could do something entirely different. And it was a lot of fun to do. No, uh, I, I, I have several favorites of my own films. Uh, I, I like The Thing a lot. I, I, mean, I think that's pretty good. I like Halloween. But to go through, to go through various films, uh, it's hard to separate the experience from the movie. Some of the experiences were great, some were awful. It doesn't really have anything to do with whether the movie was good. Uh, and sometimes you try a subject or a film and it doesn't work out. Sometimes you love those more than the ones that do. So I, I don't really have a, a one favorite overall. My father was definitely one of the biggest influences in my life. He gave me a, a gift of creativity. And, and he said, what, no matter what you want, no matter what you do in life, do something creative. Write, paint, music, whatever you want to do. My mother, on the other hand, gave me the gift of fantasy. And uh, so those combined has served me well throughout my career. I, I became happy with being John Carpenter, put it that way. Uh, I think I would have loved to, like I told you, direct a Western. Um, I got a chance to do a kind of romantic comedy with Starman, which was uh, someone else's screenplay, which was, for me, a very different type of film. I shot some comedies, but... Um, I came to see that I, I was seen, uh, and others saw me a certain way, and that that I needed to embrace it. And it's funny, it's like people are going to lose control, and you got exactly right. to keep the top on. You have to keep the top on. You have to keep the top on. These passionate people running around <laughs> making movies. My biggest goal in life was to be a working director, a guy who made his living directing movies. That was my goal when I was younger. And... Uh, after a certain number of, of, of fantasy films, thrillers, science fiction, horror, whatever you want to call them, I realized, well, you know, that's okay. I enjoy doing this. And I became known for that. I would start it right here. Okay. And as he comes in Good. and hit him, I would pull back like this. Got it. Okay? Yeah. One of the great things about scary movies and horror is that we're all afraid of the same things. Every human being is. We're all afraid of death. We're, all, all the fears that our societies and individuals have, <clears throat> we share it. So as we may not share comedy across uh, cultural lines, but boy, do we scare, we are, uh, the fear is exactly the same. That's why I think uh, horror films are more classical, they're more, they're more universal. They, 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 they last with a lot of audiences, resonate.